<clears throat> Hello, uh, we'll talk now about uh, Bartolomeo Amanati, uh, born in 1511 and died in 1592. Uh, let's, uh, let's read a little bit about him. Bartolomeo Amanati, born on the 18th of June, 1511, and died in April 1592, was an Italian architect and sculptor, born in Settignano near Florence. He studied under Baccio Bandinelli and Jacopo Sansovino, Sansovino, assisting on the design of the Library of St. Mark's, a very important building, the Biblioteca Marciana in Venice, and closely imitated the style of Michelangelo. But by the way of Biblioteca Marciana in Venice, I do have to say that Palladio considered this building, this particular building, the Library of St. Mark's, uh, uh, Biblioteca Marciana, the most important building built since the ancient times, since the Roman uh, times until the Renaissance. So Andrea Palladio was very, very enthusiastic about this work of Jacopo Sansovino, who was assisted at that time by Bartolomeo Amanati, who later on uh, closely imitated the style of Michelangelo. So let's see some of his works. But before we do so, let's uh, read a little bit more about him. He was more distinguished in architecture than in sculpture. He worked in Rome in collaboration with Vignola and Vasari, including designs for the Villa Giulia, but also for works and at Lucca. Uh, he labored during 1558 and 1570 in the refurbishment and enlargement of, of the Pitti Palace in uh, Florence, creating the courtyard consisting of three wings with rusticated facades and one lower portico leading to the amphitheater in the Boboli Gardens. His design mirrored the appearance of the main external facade of Pitti. He was also named Consul of Academia delle, delle Arti del Disegno of Florence, which had been founded by the Duke Cosimo I in 1563. In, in 1569, Amanati was commissioned to build the Ponte Santa Trinita, a bridge over the, the Arno River in Florence. The three arches are elliptic, and though very light and elegant, had survived when floods had damaged other Arno bridges at different times. Santa Trinita was destroyed in 1944 during World War II and rebuilt in 1957. Some drawings by Bartolomeo Amanati. Of course, at that time, uh, important architects uh, were also important painters, sculptors. They drew very well. Uh, there is no, it's, it, it probably would have been difficult to find a, a, an architect of importance who didn't draw uh, magnificently. It's very possible that this drawing, such a drawing, Walter Gropius couldn't do. Bartolomeo Amanati. Some sculptures by him in Florence itself. Um, interestingly, he, um, he, followed, so to speak, uh, Michelangelo in his own work. Uh, Michelangelo uh, wrote uh, very, or expressed himself very critically vis-a-vis -vis this uh, particular uh, fountain, uh, you know, animated with sculptures by Amanati. But I think, uh, actually, in retrospect, they don't look so bad. Uh, but they irritated Michelangelo, of course. The artists are irritated by the work of other artists. So we are in Florence at the time, the 16th century, with the work of um, Bartolomeo Amanati. Uh, this is another sculpture by him, or statue. Again, back to Florence.
Venus, a variation on the classical type known as Venus Pudica. However, the arms are the result of an 18th century restoration as the original had the arms cut off in order to allow water to flow out. Anyway, um, Dragon. Maybe I'm not knowledgeable enough, but I think this kind of imagery um, has echoes from the Middle Ages. I don't know of too many works of uh, terribilita, if I am to call it so, from the Renaissance. But it seems Bartolomeo Amanati was not afraid to, uh, you know, to show beasts, to sculpt beasts like this dragon. Justice another uh, statue, another sculpture by him. And we are back in the city of Florence. And uh, here we see works, um, you know, exposed uh, outside. I could see why Michelangelo didn't value Bartolomeo Amanati as a sculptor. But sometimes, uh, you know, uh, works which appear to be less, uh, uh, influential or less even uh, uh, prodigiously produced uh, have significance. It's just that it depends on our perception. Maybe a weak form of sculpture, a sculpture has, uh, has virtues or values that are not to be ignored sometimes. But at th that time he was valued without doubt, since he was commissioned to adorn uh, such an important uh, piazza square in, in the middle of, uh, of uh, such a famous city as Florence. Piazza della Signoria, it's, it's right in front of the, maybe the, the central, uh, uh, you know, um, institution uh, of, 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 of Florence at the time, Signoria. Christ and Cananit, uh, Cananit woman by Alessandro Alori, commissioned by Amanati for funeral of his wife, poet Laura Batiferi, painted as old woman with a book. <clears throat> so here Bartolomeo Amanati commissioned uh, this artist Alessandro Alori to do this work where his wife who died, Laura Batiferi, a poet, uh, appears. And this is the portrait, again, was not done by Bartolomeo Amanati, but it's a very fine portrait and uh, a fine homage to, uh, to his wife, the poet. Uh, it moves me to see this uh, interplay, this uh, dialogue between artists and, uh, you know, uh, paying homage to someone who died. And uh, here we have a poetess, not an accountant or a banker, but a poetess, you know. Uh, maybe we need some changes in our culture because today it would be almost inconceivable that a, a, a painter or a sculptor uh, or an architect would pay homage to, let's say, his wife uh, in this way. And it would be even more inconceivable almost that uh, his wife would be a poet and not, uh, I don't know what, in the economical machine and the production machine of high capitalism. Architecture by Bartolomeo Amanati. He worked in Rome in collaboration with Vignola and Vasari, including designs for the Villa Giulia. What exactly he did here, I do not know, but he contributed together with uh, uh, Vasari and, and Vignola. I think he did some works here where you see these uh, Cariatids, you know, supporting the second floor. Um, but I don't know exactly what. The Ducal Palace in Lucca and it is a palace and even has a, some kind of a modernity, I would say. You know, after seeing the works of um, Adolf Meyer and Walter Gropius, uh, here we are centuries earlier in Italy. And uh, I look at this palace and uh, 
I almost foresee somehow over the centuries uh, the new buildings in Dessau by Walter Gropius. Of course, uh, someone would say I'm crazy because uh, here the windows are vertical and this is in no way a modern building, but I see in its simplicity uh, a possible, uh, uh, you know, uh, anticipation of, uh, uh, of what Gropius did later on. Maybe now at a more detailed uh, view, what I said maybe is not quite correct. Uh, it's possible. But I think it's a fine palace. I, I, I like it and it's not uh, uh, very famous, uh, but uh, I mean, certainly not as famous as Palazzo Pitti, where he contributed, uh, um, will show, well, here there were several architects who contributed. Uh, it's a very famous palace and a very famous garden, the Boboli Garden. I think he did this part, the transition between the palace and the garden. Maybe also uh, we did some work on the facades. Um, this is Palazzo Pitti seen from the from the entrance, the, the main facade, so to speak. So I think in this area, um, um, Amanati worked. And the previous picture was taken some from somewhere here, uh, looking at the main facade of this famous uh, palace in, in Florence, Palazzo Pitti. And the Boboli gardens are here, extending it, very famous gardens. The St. Trinity Bridge in Florence, with the three arches. The works, uh, these own uh, sculptural work uh, in the proximity of uh, Signoria, uh, we saw them before, uh, many pictures with it. And now the bridge, also done by Bartolomeo Amanati in Florence. over the river Arno. So as we read, when the, the, the flooding happened of Arno, this, uh, this particular bridge endured and resisted. But he was, it was destroyed in the Second World War and this, it was uh, uh, remade. What is this? The Fountain of January, Fontana del Genaio in Florence. Uh, I like this work by uh, Bartolomeo Amanati, whatever Michelangelo might, might have said. Where is it? Parco di Villa Reale di Castello. Villa di Castello, the Fountain of January. We know that the name January, the word January comes from Janus, the famous uh, Roman god of uh, doorways and beginnings who looks two ways. Is, that's why he's the, the god of the doorways, because he looked both ways. And is um, the, the god of thresholds, of doorways, of beginnings. And that's why the month of January took the name from this god, Janus. So this is the fountain of January, of uh, Del Genaio of January in Florence. Uh, uh, I I like this work, and I like even the expression of uh, of, of this uh, uh, you know uh, this culture done by Bartolomeo Amanati. It is as if he is uh, you know questioning the the meaning of a, of a new year starting once more. Maybe you know, some kind of a philosopher, a little bit skeptical about all this, you know, cyclical uh, renewals.
I don't consider Bartolomeo Amanati, at least in this work, as being, uh, you know, uh, an inferior sculptor. And I don't see him also, um, you know, uh, following uh, uh, placidly on the footsteps of Michelangelo. No, he is on his own here and he's a, he's a, he's a, a sculptor, uh, uh, a thinking sculptor with his own way of seeing things and doing things. This is my opinion, without being an expert. The Jesuit College in Rome was one of Amanati's later designs, 1582-1584. So it is in Rome. We are not in Florence any longer, 1582-1584. That's it. So uh, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about him. Okay, we'll talk now about, about Charles Eames, 1907-1978. So he died at 71. Uh, and let's read a little bit about him. Charles Ormond Eames Jr. was born on June 17th, was an American designer, architect, and filmmaker in creative partnership with his spouse, Ray Kaiser Eames, he was responsible for, for groundbreaking contributions in the field of architecture, furniture design, industrial design, manufacturing, and the photographic arts. I, uh, <clears throat> Eames studied architecture at Washington University in St. Louis on an architecture scholarship, but only for two years. After two years of study, he left the university. Many sources claim that he was dismissed because of his advocacy of Frank Lloyd Wright and his interest in modern architecture or modern architects. The university reportedly dropped him because of his two modern views. Didn't we talk about this before that you have to give everything? So he was a man who was punished for his two modern views. But other sources, less frequently cited, know that while a student, Charles Eames, was also employed as an architect at the firm of True Blood and Graf, the demands on his time from this employment and his classes led to sleep deprivation and diminished performance at the university. Well, it's a classical example of a brilliant mind and a brilliant soul who couldn't conform to the strictness of a certain program. It's okay. Uh, as uh, I don't know who actually said it. Maybe uh, was it Marcel Breuer or I forgot because I, 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 I encountered this saying uh, several times in connection with several uh, people. You know, design is my, uh, something I don't even remember now very well the saying, something like design was mine, history is mine, or something like this. History belongs to Charles Sims and be belongs to, to, to him uh, beyond uh, you know, the, these uh, anecdotal happenings with the school. Charles Sims earned his place in, in the history of architecture and design and art. This was the man. Uh, and uh, a very interesting uh, creator on, uh, with uh, wide interests, um, with a paradoxical beginning in architecture. And we are going to see his um, his uh, early works before he made uh, met his wife, Ray. Here they are, the two of them. Uh, they they it was really a, a great love story because they. They contributed uh, together uh, magnificently to the field of design uh, and architecture. And I would say uh, also art, perhaps. There is a picture, I hope I have it here. Yes, this one, which I love, because it shows the playfulness of these people, you know? Look at them, they are like kids, you know, enjoying themselves. That's why I keep saying and saying and saying work and play should come together in order to achieve joy in the act of creation. 
Charles Eames and Ray uh, uh, Eames. And here they are, look, like, uh, like uh, uh, school, uh, school pupils, school children, you know, hand in hand. I think they are beautiful and they are beautiful because they were in love and because they were both very creative. And I think she had, Ray had a, a great, uh, great impact on, on, on Charles Eames. Some drawings of Charles Eames, you know, typical student works. There are many students in architecture who, who could show such uh, such studies. Now, you know, later studies for uh, furniture, for fur for furnishings, for for uh, 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 furniture. He designed many chairs, famous chairs. Another, you know, uh, obviously he knew how to draw very well. A chair, Charles Eames. Maybe Albert Einstein was right. The best, the best research is playing. So, you know, you can tell from these drawings even that there was playfulness in the in the approach to design that uh, Charles uh, Eames uh, showed. Like in this letter, I think to his uh, sis, uh, to his daughter. Uh, where is it? You know, yes, you see, signed Daddy. And look at the drawing, at the sketch. It's very playful. And, and this playfulness, I think, is, 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 uh, is an important part of the engine which fuels uh, creativity. It's important to be playful. St. Mary, but here we see his early be the beginnings of his um, uh, built work. Uh, this uh, St. Saint, Saint Mary's Church in, in Arkansas, in Helena, Arkansas, from 1934. I like this building very much. It's not, it's not what pe people usually know about him, Charles Sims. I didn't even know that he built churches when he was young and not this kind of church where the Gothic element is, uh, is, is quite uh, present. Well, you know, it was 1934, was not the Middle Ages and was the United States, not, uh, you know, uh, Europe. But Still, there is a, a seriousness of design here that uh, uh, I think uh, is noble. And uh, even uh, structurally, the building has uh, an integrity. You look at the, uh, the, um, uh, you know, the woodwork of the roof and uh, you see that, uh, you know, there is logic there, there is sensitivity. Uh, it's a convincing building even though if the, the, the level of innovation is not yet alarmingly uh, uh, present. So this is an early work by Charles Sims. We are going to see another church also in Arkansas that he built. But I like this, this, these works at, at the beginning of his uh, architectural uh, production, if I am to call it so, production. St. Mary's Catholic Church in Paragould, Arkansas, also in Arkansas, but in a different place, 1935. From here to his well-known, well-documented modern work is quite a distance. But I think this, uh, these beginnings are important as well. He built these works before he met Ray, his wife, uh, I think his second wife. And uh, she had, uh, I think she facilitated his uh, uh, emancipation, so to speak, uh, towards um, uh, resolute uh, modernity. Charles Eames. But the, a certain feeling for playfulness and for the dynamics, uh, in, even in the field of aesthetics, you see the stained glass window, which, which uh, there is implied uh, rotation. 
uh, and the diagonals also create a sense of um, dynamic uh, uh, composition. And, and this will show amplified in his uh, modern works. The Meyer House from 1936 to 1938 in Missouri, quite a large house. Brick all over. But look at this. And indeed, if you work with bricks, you could uh, personalize some bricks with whatever message you want to send out, you know, like I don't know exactly why he created these um, musical uh, notations here on these bricks, but isn't it a nice idea, you know, to, to have a fragment of the elevation uh, animated by a mysterious inscription that it is a musical notation or whatever else. The brick accommodates uh, such uh, uh, accidents, if we are to call them so. It's a big house, not yet as modern as he was able to build later, but I, I would say still a building of distinction. Another house, 1936. He also collaborated with uh, Iro Sarinen, a very important uh, American architect, but uh, from, uh, you know, with uh, Finnish parents. His father was also a very important Finnish architect, uh, Eliel Sarinen. But Charles Eames collaborated with um, Iro Sarinen, who unfortunately he died rather young himself at 50 or so. You see here with Hiro Sarin and he did this bridge house in 1945, a modern building through and through, but it was not built. Here it is, the, the project. Quite unexpected, no? When we think that just a few years earlier, he designed those churches with, which would not have anticipated in any way this great transformation. Even the house that we just saw with those bricks with the musical notations, from there to here is a very long distance, aesthetically speaking, structurally speaking, and so on. But look what he did just a few hours later, together with Hiro Sarin. was not built, but he built other works later on. And one of them became the famous uh, own house. I mean, his and Ray's. The Jefferson National Expansion Memorial Competition from 1947. Here I cannot understand what's going on because it's impossible to read all the text. But, uh, you know, even as a graphic work, uh, some young architects, um, it shows, uh, uh, you know, dedication and a certain complexity. They I probably didn't win. Now, the Eames, Eames House, they built several case study houses. Uh, this is case study house number eight, and it became the famous Eames House, meaning for built for himself and uh, his wife, uh, Ray. 1949, so uh, 74 years ago. Uh, we are going to see many pictures a bit later. Now, this is house number nine. I forgot exactly what this, this, this uh, case study houses were built for. I think they were supposed to, to create some houses, uh, uh, you know, uh, part of a program, uh, you know, some social program to uh, develop a new way of building uh, and maybe for some kind of a mass production. I don't know the particulars, but uh, they build several case, that's why they are called the experimental houses, case study house number nine. Uh, this is the Intensa house. And Tenza was a very interesting man uh, who uh, ran, a, was the editor of a very famous uh, arts and architecture magazine. 
uh, and I think he commissioned them to build these case study houses. I'm very interested actually in John John and Tensa, and I I I I, I should uh, uh, remind myself uh, to maybe prepare a presentation about him because it is very important to underline the role of, of uh, exceptional individuals who pushed forward, you know, the, the frontiers, who, who, who wanted a new aesthetic, who wanted a new architecture, who wanted a new art and the new design. This is the Intensa House, 1940, whatever, 1945, 1947, immediately after the war. But look at the, at the building, it's very, it's almost contemporary. It's it's clearly a, a, a modernism without uh, too, too many doubts. And the house that uh, house number eight, case study number eight, uh, is even more uh, um, you know creative. And we are going to see it in detail a little bit later on. This mid-century architecture was a very interesting period uh, within which uh, arts and uh, you know uh, furniture design industrial design architecture uh, manifested themselves with the optimism that uh, resulted from the end of the war and uh, it was a belief that uh, you know a war will not happen again and that uh, you know uh, it was like a rebirth but look at the war now in Ukraine. So it seems humans don't learn anything. It is very, very sad. The demon of destruction exists within us, it seems. And death as well. Who would have thought that Russia, which sold, lost millions of people in the Second World War, will start another deadly war in the 21st century. The Herman Miller showroom from 1950 in Los Angeles, California. Uh, again, a surprisingly modern facade of this showroom for this important manufacturer, the Herman Miller Furniture uh, Company. The bench, I'm sure, was not designed by Charles and Ray Eames. <laughs> It's really out of place. I am I'm an advocate of, of benches in the United States everywhere, but somehow this bench, this particular bench in front of this building seems to be a little bit uh, uh, out of place. Anyway, and now we arrive at uh, the famous uh, house, which was a case study house, case study house number eight, the Eames house, and it is a brilliant house from all points of view. The interior is, uh, is fluid, the space is flowing, it's um, joyous, it's open, it's democratic, it's, uh, uh, it has good light, uh, it, it is not pretentious, it's not a pretentious house. And look at the beauty of the uh, uh, contrast between the trees, nature, and the building. And they complement each other uh, brilliantly. Uh, here they are, Ray uh, uh, Eames and uh, Charles Eames together. Um, I am sure there was uh, deep love between them. And uh, this is shown in everything they did and in every, every picture of them. Yeah, he is like a child, you know, uh, sitting on those cubes. He, I'm sure he experimented with those cubes. He played with those cubes. Um, 
the Eames House, Charles and Ray Eames, unafraid of using color. They even employed uh, construction elements bought from uh, Home Depot, from uh, you know, department departmental stores that sold uh, you know prefabricated elements, and they put them together brilliantly, creatively and made uh, one of the most famous uh, houses of the 20th century. They designed the, the chairs, the armchair in front of the picture in the foreground. We are going to see the designs as well. Um, the Eames house, case study house number eight. It is studied in uh, architecture schools. As you can see, this was a page uh, taken from uh, students' uh, work. I think it is brilliant, this, uh, the dialectics between architecture, the work of man, and the trees, the work of God, nature and culture, man and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the trees, man and, the na and, and, and nature. Is, is, uh, they complement each other, I think, uh, uh, beautifully here. They don't have to, architecture didn't have to mimic nature. It is by itself uh, very individualized, and yet it doesn't uh, divorce itself from nature. I think it, it adds something to nature in a way, the, that uh, uh, contrast through which both are emphasized. Kim's house. And now some furniture designs by uh, Charles and Ray Eames. They are still produced. Uh, they are very well designed, very comfortable. As we know, many architects design chairs, some of the most famous. And indeed, to design a chair is a, a very uh, pleasant uh, activity and even therapeutic. I think to design a chair is, uh, is, uh, can be more difficult than, uh, and more pleasant than to design a skyscraper, as Ms. van der Rohe actually said it. Charles Eames. This one is a little bit whimsical, but I guess it works. I'm not so sure about the simultaneous usage of uh, wood and uh, plastic, but
As we can see, these chairs were intended for mass production. You bought them in a box and then you put them together following the instructions. The best preparation is a general education. I've never found a good mind that allowed techniques to stand in its way. By education, I do not mean schooling. I mean the development of a sensitivity to the forces that give structure to life. Very, very nice, Charles Sims. So again, he understood by education what is meant to be understood. You know, education is not necessarily schooling, grades and all the rest, or diplomas. Education is about, uh, is, is, it, it is, uh, it is uh, born from, uh, from uh, curiosity. No, education is about uh, enriching yourself, regardless of uh, lucrative outcomes. That is true education. It has nothing to do with grades and diplomas and the points and uh, pleasing a professor. Absolutely nothing. Education is about your development as a human being. You try to achieve your, 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 your highest potential. And in order to do that, you need to educate yourself. It's about you and you. It's about your own growth. And it's not about uh, formalities and appearances and so on. He understood what education is. The best preparation is a general education. I've never found a good mind that allowed techniques, and I, I could add the grades and diplomas and so on, to stand in its way, in, 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 in the way of education. By education, I do not mean schooling. I mean the development of a sensitivity to the forces that give structure to, to life. And here he meets actually Frank Lloyd Wright, who said, you know, uh, the main thing is uh, to have an educated heart. He didn't say an educated uh, um, uh, brain. He said an educated heart. And even Le Corbusier said something very similar. He expected architects to be the most educated and the most sensitive, and particularly in matters relating to art. And uh, in a letter written to a small group of uh, young architects in South Africa, uh, Le Corbusier went further by saying that he expected architects to have the, the most uh, uh, sophisticated and the most educated, the most uh, understanding mind born from uh, from uh, education and not a closed mind like that of the baker in the in the corner of the street. Unfortunately, in my experience, I met many architects and students in architecture who do not understand the value of a true education. And this is very, very, very sad. Take your pleasure seriously. Beautiful. It's about... Uh, something I often talk um, uh, about, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's about marrying work with, 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 uh, with play. Take your pleasure seriously. Yes, in other words, try to combine uh, work with play. Be creative, and in order to be creative, you also be, have to be playful, otherwise you cannot be creative. Take your pleasure seriously. That's it.